Okay, Congressman Poe, how are you today? I'm excellent, thanks. We sure appreciate you coming back to talk with our audience at uh, Texas GOP Vote. Um, I'd like to start by talking about your record on Capitol Hill. It's quite story. Um, what do you consider to be your biggest achievements as a U.S. Representative for the 2nd Congressional District? There are several things that I'm proud of. I guess uh, the one that I'm uh, especially proud of is being chairman of the Victims' Rights Caucus. Uh, based on my background as a prosecutor and as a judge, uh, I came to know victims uh, in the worst part of their lives. Yeah. Got to Congress, uh, myself and uh, Jim Costa, Democrat from California, started the Bipartisan Victims' Rights Caucus. We passed some real good legislation, starting with the uh, Adam Walsh Child Safety Act, which requires uh, sex offenders uh, when they leave prison somewhere in the United States, they have to register on that national database. What was occurring was that they were getting out of prison, they'd register in their state, but they'd leave the state and go somewhere else and commit their uh, dastardly deeds. Right. And now we're keeping up with them. And we've also had legislation to protect Americans on the cruise vessels when crimes are committed against them. Uh, that has passed, that's the law. And uh, Peace Corps legislation to protect our Peace Corps volunteers when they go overseas because many times crimes are committed against them and nothing happens and so now we're protecting them and making sure that their needs are met if they are crime victims. So a lot of good crime victims legislation uh, I think is better and helps, uh, helps the American public. That's wonderful. Um, what do you love most about your office? Well I like being a, a representative, uh, an advocate. I look at it as an advocate for the, the state of Texas representing 747,000 people. Uh, of course, I think I represent all Texans, and I do. Uh, being able to present their case, if you will, to other members of Congress uh, and advocate on their behalf, whether it's in the committee hearing or whether it's on the House floor, which I get on the House floor almost every day, talking about the principles that Texans believe in. Uh, so that's the best part, representing and advocating on behalf of uh, the core values and principles of, of Texans. It's fantastic. I'd like to ask you what you're working on at present. I uh, just watched an interview you gave with Fox. Um, uh, are there any specific uh, laws, projects, initiatives you're advancing? There are several that are on the table. Uh, one of uh, which that uh, is very recent. I filed legislation regarding uh, drones in the United States. Uh, what is occurring is because of technology uh, by 20 30, 2020 rather, there will be 30,000 drones over American airspace controlled by federal authorities, local authorities, and civilians. And Congress has an obligation to make sure there are constitutional protections on those drones. So I filed legislation to, to do two things. Basically, make the Fourth Amendment right of privacy, right of search and seizure protection apply to drones. So when law enforcement wants to use a drone, they have to follow the constitutional standards. Of course, there are exceptions like they already have uh, for disasters, national emergencies, etc. And then, uh, really more importantly, controls to the drones that are used, going to be used by civilians, either individuals or corporations or businesses or investigators, to make sure that those drones aren't flying over uh, you know, protected, sovereign property uh, of American citizens. So regulate both of those and we need to do that now before we have a situation that is out of control. Of course, of course there's exceptions. There will be, a, we can still use drones on the borders because it's a national security issue. But that's the, that's the uh, uh, legislation they're working on right now. Drones over American airspace. The drones are coming, as I like to say. <laughs> well, I'm sure many American citizens share your sentiment on that. It is. It's a, something that is It's not a partisan issue. It's, it's an issue about right of privacy and big government uh, uh, controlling, uh, you know, snooping around without uh, any reason except the government wants to do that. And same with civilians. Well, me personally and many people I've spoken with get images of uh, George Orwell. Uh, well, it's uh, George Orwell, you know, might have, been a, uh, might have been a prophet and we want to make sure he was wrong. So, well, thank you, Brother Rain and Werner. Um, as far as your style, your approach in Congress, uh, your no-nonsense style has been referred to by some in the media. Um, what do you feel you contribute overall to Congress? I bring a conservative Texas voice to, to Washington. Um, I don't know the political uh, words a lot of times, so I don't do political correctness. I don't say things in a diplomatic way. 
One thing I'll never be is a diplomat for the State Department. Uh, I just kind of tell it like it is. That's you know, as blunt as I can, as I can, and uh, I do that. Uh, some people uh, like what I say. Some people don't. But no one ever questions where I stand on an issue. And I think that's what people want. They want the people in Congress uh, uh, to to be very candid about how their philosophy is about the government and the American people. So I am blunt. Well, and we like you, Blunt, and we thank you for that. Um, you touched briefly on civil liberties, on the idea of the Fourth Amendment protections of privacy. Um, I'd like to flesh that out a little bit more, if that's okay. Um, American government has been changing dramatically in the past three years. Uh, we've seen sizable power uh, migrate to the executive branch under President Obama. Um, and a lot of people are seeing their basic, most essential civil liberties, like Hades Corpus, a lot of folks are very concerned about the National Defense Authorization Act and provisions therein. Um, in your opinion, is America on the verge of a vast increase in restrictions on individual liberty? And if so, what can Republicans do to counter? The argument has been since 9-11 that we need more uh, national security and more protection uh, against uh, the bad guys, if you will, right. protection, safety. Unfortunately, historically, people throughout history have always been willing to give up personal liberty in the name of safety. They just do. They have. And that's the debate that started on 9-11. Give up your personal liberty for safety. I believe, as Franklin said, you can have both. You can have personal liberty and you can have safety. Uh, and in a democracy, we have to have both. We cannot give up our personal liberty in the name of safety. And we can, we can really have uh, safety and without infringement on uh, personal liberty. So we have that battle, and that's the reason that it started. Uh, and we continue to have that battle uh, really throughout uh, since 9-11 on a lot of different issues. Uh, I have probably become more of a civil libertarian after being in Congress than I was even as a judge. Uh, those, uh, those amendments, the first uh, uh, ten amendments especially of our uh, Constitution, are vital for who we are. They identify us and uh, we have an obligation as members of Congress to make sure that those amendments are protected. Many people, now uh, there are those who want to just do away with any personal liberty all in the name of safety and uh, we can't allow that to occur. We certainly hope that we can get ahead of the curve on that. Um, to most of us, and certainly as a journalist, looking from afar, it appears as if the Republican Congress is rubber stamping a lot of things, or at least uh, not being as active as they possibly could in opposing some of President Obama's power grabs. Um, could you maybe explain that why uh, there's so little activity, and at most sometimes total resolutions in response to uh, President Obama and some of the actions. I believe the President has uh, gone further than the Constitution allows him to on executive power. Uh, he does it because he can get away with it. His executive orders, for example. An executive order was uh, first came about when a President would look at a piece of legislation and Maybe it's, it's legislation that uh, uh, deals with the Department of Agriculture. The executive order would further explain that piece of legislation to the Department of Agriculture, how they would, to, would maybe allocate resources, funds. Executive orders have gone from that to a position where an executive order is nothing more than just a law. The president is not clarifying law or trying to explain it so it can be administered because that's what they're supposed to do in the administration. He just writes an edict from the White House, sends it out to the fruited plain, and thou shalt do this. To me, those executive orders are a violation of the Constitution. And he continues to do it. Uh, so what can we do in Congress? What should we do? We were one, one third of really the legislative process. That's the Senate and the President has to sign off on. And uh, the main thing the House can do is prohibit funds. 
to stop funds from going to the administration on any of these executive orders. The czars are a perfect example. He appoints these czars, their little kings in their little area that uh, rule over areas of our life. They're not vetted by the Senate. They aren't approved by the Senate as the Constitution requires. They never passed the Senate, even the Democrat Senate. So the President just appoints his little kings throughout the Fruited Plain to rule over us. Uh, they, sh they should not get funds from taxpayers. That's one way to do it. Uh, we can sue, of course, the President, take him to court, take each one of these. That's a long process. But the answer is the American people now have to do something about it. Congress can do what it can, stopping funds, but the American people have to replace the person who's issuing these unconstitutional directives. And that's what they have to do in uh, November. Thank you for that. Certainly that's our primary focus right now. Um, as far as the NDAA, the National Defense Authorization Act, this has been something that has uh, been caused for grave concern among civil liberties advocates, uh, certainly myself. Um, and uh, there seems to be a disparity, a lack of understanding. Uh, you have Senators Graham and McCain who clearly believe that this legislation gives uh, the military the power to indefinitely detain American citizens, and they've said so on camera. And you have President Obama has not signing statements similarly uh, acknowledged that it did achieve that purpose, but it's within his discretion. Obama's discretion is not a very comforting thought for many Americans. Um, can you maybe clarify and just shed more light on what that piece of legislation does and what it does not do? Okay. Um, the um, first draft of the NDAA was the one that got all the publicity. That draft was not, it did not become law. Uh, a second piece of legislation was actually what became the law. But all of the controversy was over the first draft. So let's go and talk about exactly what the legislation did. Up until this legislation passed, because of 9-11, the President, George Bush, had the authority to detain American citizens on American soil. And it occurred at least in one case where a person was detained and then put off the coast of Virginia in some type of ship, American citizen. So this legislation does this. It says, first of all, it does not apply to American citizens in the United States. It does not apply to American citizens in the United States. The Gomer Amendment said the same thing. It really doesn't apply to American citizens in the United States. Constitution applies under all forms of legislation, but especially this legislation. So who does it apply to? It applies to non-American citizens. Now what about overseas? Of course it applies to non-American citizens, but it also applies to American citizens overseas in specific situations. Those people who are actively, actively supporting Al-Qaeda and are active in a uh, form of terrorism planning a plot against the United States specifically overseas. The best example of that occurring was the imam that, uh, imam that helped the Fort Hood killer was an American citizen. He was working overseas, and he was giving him information, the, the Fort Hood killer, and uh, that was an American citizen. American uh, military took that individual, took him out, but the because he's, in act, he's in, uh, involved in an act of terrorism, war, if you will, against the United States, but it's overseas. So, but what if that person would have been arrested? Well, he'd have been treated through military tribunals, military courts, American courts, which you still have rights. It doesn't apply to American citizens in the United States. They have all of the constitutional protection. So really, it, 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 it's something that there's been a lot of conversations about, but people just need to go ahead and read the law. The president made the comment when he signed the legislation. I'm not going to use it against American citizens, even though I can. Of course, that would only be in overseas, because it doesn't apply to Americans in the United States. So. Uh, anyway, I, but people should be concerned about any legislation that may uh, involve civil liberties and uh, uh, we can have both civil liberties and we can have safety. Thank you very much.
Congressman Powell, you've spoken on numerous occasions about the unsustainable trajectory of current federal spending levels. Uh, just how bad is it? And can selective cuts in defense and entitlements truly prevent the pending, the pending uh, train wreck? Here's what's current. No, and get too many numbers, I get confused. But I'll give you one that I, I understand, I think the American public understands. Every day the federal government brings in to the coffers through mainly taxation, $5 billion, billion. But every day, the federal government spends $9 billion. Five in, nine out. You got a $4 billion deficit and debt every day. And it just gets worse. And if we don't do something dramatic soon, we'll be bankrupt like Greece. Only because of our size and some other factors, this hasn't already happened. That explains the problem that's the root of all evil, that deficit. It explains all of our economic trouble. It explains why jobs, why people aren't hiring folks in small business. It all is based on that one number. And it is a, a, a situation that Congress has talked about for as long as I've been there. And as my grandfather used to say, when all said and done, more said than done. And not a whole lot's happened. So cutting a hundred billion a hundred million here, a hundred million there, that's not gonna solve the problem. And uh, the defense cuts, you know, the Department of Defense has been cut dramatically over a period of years. It's not just not just now. It's been cut dramatically. That's not the answer because even if we eliminated the Department of Defense and all of our troops all over the world. That's not going to change that figure much at all. And the real problem is two-thirds of the entire cost of government is on three, pro three programs, Medicare, Social Security, and Medicaid. Those three are not sustainable because more is being spent on those than is certainly coming in. Social Security uh, is supposed to have been a, like a trust fund where money's put in and then you get it when you retire. That's not happening. Money's coming in and money's going out. If you were in the private sector and you had some kind of financial program where you did that, Rob Peter to pay Paul, you'd probably be in prison. But it's the federal government's doing that with Social Security. Uh, Medicare, uh, same situation. Some is coming in, but a whole lot more is going out. And if we don't address the fact that these th three programs are not sustainable, uh, we're going to have a train wreck. Anybody who talks about fixing those three, though, nobody like, wants to hear that. But the reality of it is we have to fix those three. And we can. And we can make them all solvent. And we can make it solvent for the next generation as well without eliminating any of those programs. And there are a lot of things we can do. One is cut out the fraud. Medicare is $67 billion a year in Medicare fraud. Well, those people need to be going to jail, whoever it is. Uh, so... Cutting 100 here, 100 million there, doesn't solve any problem. Congress must make the hard decisions, and we need the American public to say, here's where we want you to cut. That's refreshing. Uh, I wish more in Congress shared your approach. Um, military, let's touch on that briefly. We've um, started seeing more inc excursions, um, interventionism um, with the present administration. Uh, not much has changed over the last three administrations, as a matter of fact, in the way the military is used surgically. Um, to address certain problems worldwide. What's your view? Do you support the surgical use of the U.S. military to intermittently intervene in the conflicts of other states like Libya uh, without authorization from Congress? Where do you draw the line? Well, Libya is a perfect example. I thought that was an unconstitutional war on the part of the United States. Uh, the president went in and started dropping bombs on another nation. To me, that is a war, uh, especially with those people who get the bombs dropped on them. Now, the president made an interesting comment when he declared that he could do that. He said, this is a war in the name of humanity. A war in the name of humanity. What does that mean? That means that the president of the United States, when he sees that there is something inhumane taking place out there in the world, that we can go and start dropping bombs on those people. Because it's the humane thing to do is to save these other people in that country, I suspect, from the inhumane guys. Uh, that's an interesting philosophy that basically gives the president authority to do whatever he wants, whenever he wants. The Constitution doesn't give the president the authority to 
at war in Native community. Uh, I think we should only be involved in some type of military operation when it's in the national security interest of the United States. Not just the interest, but the national security interest of the United States. Libya was not in the national security interest of the United States. Omar Gaddafi was a bad guy. He should have been in jail. I'd like to try him as a judge. But that does not give us justification for starting a war, even with NATO, somewhere else in the world. It's a very disturbing thing, and I think it's a violation of uh, certainly the intent of the Constitution, where Congress is to make the determination when we should use military abroad in our national interest, not the President. So that's my feeling on the uh, situation. And who, well, who's next? Is Syria next? Are we going to start dropping bombs in Syria? No one knows, only the President. Can't be anywhere and everywhere either, can we? Um, well, Congressman Poe, that's about it. Um, I sure appreciate your time, sir. Our readers at Texas GOP Vote can see this interview at www.texasgopvote.com. Thanks again, sir. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you.